Hebrews chapter 4. And, uh, and verse 12. Just the, just the one verse this morning. It says, uh, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word quick there is old English, it means alive or living. The word of God is living. We sing a song to the children in our Sunday club uh, sessions, and uh, it's a song that goes like this. The best book to read is the Bible. The best book to read is the Bible. You can read it every day. It will help you on your way. The best book to read is the Bible. Anyone heard that song? It's not a child here, heard that song before, yeah? So my question to you this morning is really quite a simple one, uh, forgive the simplicity of it, um, but I think it's something that's worth pondering. Why is the Bible the best book? You know, that's my question. Why the Bible? Are there not lots of other religious books out there that one could choose and, and you, could, you could have as your best book and you could read and study and so on? Why the Bible? What makes the Bible so special? And whilst you're sort of considering that question, maybe a, a, a number of answers are coming to your mind already. Maybe you say, well, it's the best book because it's God's Word. Or maybe you say, well, it's the best book because of the wisdom of the Bible. Or maybe you say, well, I think it's the best book because it gives me a, a workable, moral framework with which I can, I can live my life. It tells me what's right and what's wrong. And you know, I agree with all those points, but here's the problem. There are lots of other religious books in the world, and the people who, who read them and study them, they say that their book does exactly the same thing. They think that their scriptures are the Word of God. They think that their scriptures contain great wisdom. They think that their scriptures give them a workable, moral framework. In fact, I've got two... Uh, religious books with me today. Don't get nervous. Okay. Uh, I'll just show you. I've got uh, this book. This is the Book of Mormon. Okay. Put out by the LDS Church, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. And they say that this book is, quote, another testament of Jesus Christ. They say it's the Word of God. They say it contains great wisdom. Uh, and so forth. All the claims that we would make for the Bible, and they put it right alongside there, and they say, yeah, that, that's what our book has got. Do you know that, that uh, Mormonism is one of the fastest growing religions in the world today? I mean, there, there are Mormon temples in England, in America, in, in places like Nigeria, in Australia, they're all around the world. And they say, no, this is the book that you need to get hold of. This is the best book. I've got another book with me today as well, another religious book, and it's this, the Quran, or we the, the English translation of it. Um, and the Muslims say that this is the Word of God, that this is this is Holy Scripture, and they say it contains wisdom, and they say that it gives them a moral framework for living uh, their lives. You know, there's about 49 countries in the world today that the majority of people are Muslims. Uh, it's estimated about 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. 1.6 billion. Can they all be wrong? Have they got it wrong? So many people. And they say, this is, no, this is the book that you should be following. Well, I'm going to show you this morning that the Bible has a real reason to be classed as, as the best book. Maybe these are things that you've not even considered before this morning, but I hope it will give you a real robust argument to those who say, particularly I mean atheists who say, well, you, you 
chose to be a Christian, you chose to, to love the Bible, you could have chosen any book, really. They're all the same, you know, like a supermarket. You could be, oh, shall I be a Muslim, or shall I be a Hindu, or shall I be a Christian? The scriptures and the Lord Jesus Christ himself make it absolutely plain that not only is Christianity not just one of several choices, but it's the only choice for humanity. It's the only choice for you if you want to avoid eternal destruction. That it's the only choice that brings life. And that's what I want to really look at today. Is that we're going to cover four different points this morning. Uh, four points that maybe you hadn't considered before. Uh, four things that the Bible has to offer that I don't believe any of these other scriptures offer. And they are as following. The Bible contains what we call historicity. It contains an extraordinary consistency. There is prophetic fulfillment in the Bible. And also the words of the Bible are living words. What is historicity? Historicity is, I guess you would say, historical authenticity. Uh, there's an actual connecting of the words of the Bible to historical events. It's not some uh, guru up in a monastery somewhere or up in the mountains you know, sharing his wisdom with his followers, the, God unfolds the plan of redemption throughout the pages of history. There's a, there's a theologian called uh, Wolfhart Pannenberg, and he said, history is the most comprehensive horizon of Christian theology. In other words, you can see uh, the truth about God unfolding throughout history, throughout various eras, and so on, it, it is not separated from history. Rather, God works within and amongst historical events. He causes the rising and the falling of kingdoms, doesn't he? He, he causes the movement of various nations and so on. And his plan of redemption is very much, was, was very much tied in with all these things. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Luke chapter 2. Should be some familiar words this time of year. Luke chapter 2 and verse 1, and it starts off like this. Luke 2 verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Now, maybe the, the, the opening of those kind of chapters like that, and the sort of bit that you skip over, Many think, oh yeah, it's all this historical stuff. I'll just get to what's you know, really going on. And maybe you're not paying too much attention. But I want you to notice the absolute incredible amount of detail that is there. We're given uh, the name of the Roman emperor at the time. We're given the name of the governor and the, the land that he was governing. Uh, we're told of this decree that goes forth. We're given the names of the people, Joseph and Mary. We're told what land they come from. We're told what land they're going to. Uh, we're told that Bethlehem is the city of David, and so on and so forth. So many historical details are being given that tie these events into real life. It's real life, real times. Now, in the two books that I showed you, and by the way, I'm not trying to rubbish anyone's religion today or, or, or run down their scriptures, but what I'm saying is that, that just the facts themselves will speak loud enough this morning but in, in, in the Quran, there's nothing like that kind of historicity. Now, the, the, when the Prophet Muhammad speaks, he speaks in, it says it's in Medina or it says it's in Mecca. So you get that. But there's nothing like that kind of historicity there in, in, in the Quran. It, it's just really the sayings of the Prophet. Again, in the Book of Mormon, whilst there are names and there are uh, places and so on, none of them have ever been... Uh, substantially verified as being true. 
Uh, in fact, the exact opposite has been the case when um, the LDS Church were claiming, uh, and I'll, I'll quote from them, uh, they said that the Book of Mormon is the guide to almost all the major archaeological discoveries in the Americas. You know, it's about Mormonism, you know, the, the, the story of Mormonism takes place in, in North and South America with the, uh, the Nephites and the Lamanites and these, these tribes of people that they say existed. And they're trying to make the claim that, that archaeologists have been using the Book of Mormon to make all these major discoveries. And it, it got to the point where they were even citing the Smithsonian Institute as using the Book of Mormon. And they had to issue a rebuttal. I'll, I'll read you this. It's quite interesting. The, the Smithsonian Institute uh, said this, that they had never used the Book of Mormon in any way as a scientific guide said Smithsonian archaeologists see no direct connection between the archaeology of the New World and the subject matter of the Book of Mormon. So there you are, a rebuttal from the Smithsonian Institute. They make the claim that it has historicity, but actually it doesn't at all. It has never been uh, validated. Whereas the Bible, you know, you can go back into history, you can find out all about uh, uh, Caesar Augustus, you can find out, you can go and visit Jerusalem, you can go and visit Jericho, you can go and see these places, they're real, you know, and the names of these people, they're cross-referenced often, like in the Old Testament, you can look in the Babylonian Chronicles, it cross-references what First and Second Kings are, are saying and so on, it has historicity. Now, it, it is not just a history book, it's a book as well that deals in prophecy, of course, but just look how different the prophecy in the Bible is. Turn to Isaiah chapter 1. <clears throat> Maybe you've never even thought about this side of the Bible before, so I hope that it will be an encouragement to you. You know, and I hope that it will uh, make you want to read it more. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 1. Isaiah, of course, a prophet. And he says, The vision of Isaiah the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So same thing again, isn't it? Right? You get the name of the prophet, you get who his father was, you, you get where he prophesied, you get the names of the kings who were relevant at that particular time. So it puts it in a time and a place, doesn't it? You know, this is a real person. He, he's talking in a particular time during particular events. And we haven't got time to go through them all, but you could cover just about all the major prophets in the Bible. Jeremiah, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, same kind of historicity. Ezekiel, chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, even more details than I've been sharing with you there. And Daniel, chapter 1, verses 1 to 2, again, detail after historical detail shows the superiority of the biblical text, how it's not just like all the other religious books, it is far and away totally different. It contains a depth of historicity that is not found in any other religious book. Something else the Bible has, and it is an extraordinary consistency. What do I mean by that? It is, it is there are so many parts of the Bible that are consistent with itself. Now, the, the, the Book of Mormon is consistent with itself. Uh, that's fairly easy because it was written by one person. Or they would say, I guess, translated by uh, the prophet Joseph Smith. Let me give you some facts about it. Uh, Book of Mormon took three months to translate from April to June 1829. So three months to translate has 239 chapters. Uh, the Quran took a lot longer. That took 22 years and 5 months and 14 days. I'm not quite sure how they can be so precise. There you are. Uh, and uh, of course, but again, it's the writings of one prophet, isn't it? The prophet Muhammad. It has only 114 chapters or surahs. So quite a small book. So it's only about that command. Three months for, for the Book of Mormon, uh, 239 chapters, three months to, to write it down. The Quran, 22 years approximately, and 114 chapters. So, you know, perhaps you would expect a certain amount of consistency there. 
But just listen to these facts concerning the Bible. Not one book, but 66 books. Now I told a Muslim this uh, the other day, he, he didn't, didn't really know much about the Bible, he was asking me about the Bible, and I said, well no, it's, it's got lots of chapters, it's also got books. He said, do you mean it's not just one book? So I said, well it's made up of 66 books. He said, 66? His eyes really popped out of his head. 66 books? I said, yes. He said, that's a lot of books. I said, it is. 66 books written not by one man, but by over 40 different people. But not just different people, but different types of people. Kings, shepherds, farmers, fishermen, and one ex pharisee All different sorts of people. Written over not just three months, not just written over 20 odd years, but it is estimated that the Bible was written over a period of between 1,400 and 1,800 years. That's incredible, isn't it? There are 1,189 chapters in the Bible. If you've read the Bible this year, I know some people have gone all the way through it, well done. You know, that's a lot of chapters, isn't it? It's a bit more than 114 or 239. So you see how the Bible is just such far more massive book, isn't it? It's had all these different writers. You would think, you know, and they lived in different geographical locations, they had different statuses in, in, in life, and yet they all have this incredible consistency when they talk about God, they say he's a holy God, they say he's a gracious God, he's a forgiving God, he's a righteous God. And they all talk about their interaction, their experience with God, don't they? And there's this extraordinary consistency. How come? How come the Bible gets to be so consistent? Well, I put to you because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. How else could so many people in so many different walks of life talk of the same experience, talk of the same God, and there being a great consistency there. You've read Ezekiel, you've read Daniel, and then you come to Revelation, you say, hey, I've read this before. You know, there's, some, there's the same spirit. There's like all these different writers, and yet just one spirit. Men are moved by the Holy Spirit, aren't they? They were moved to write these things down and to prophesy in His name. Something else the Bible has is prophetic fulfillment. Now, there are many prophets in the Old Testament, so I want to deal with somebody from the New Testament uh, this morning. The Lord Jesus himself prophesied on many occasions. And I want to show you that that prophecy in the Bible is not just God showing, I know this, I know this is going to happen and so on, but there is a real a practical outworking uh, of what is being prophesied. Turn with me please to Luke chapter 21. Luke 21. I found this absolutely fascinating by the way when I discovered this. Luke 21. And we're going to read from verse 20. speaking, he said, And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is done. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be Fulfilled. It goes on, you can, read, you can read more of that, and it's sort of repeated again in, in Matthew 24. Now, I heard something very interesting from a, from a non-Christian Jewish historian, and he was talking about uh, the fulfillment of this particular prophecy. Now, I believe this prophecy was fulfilled in AD 70 with the destruction of Jerusalem. 
And this uh, uh, Jewish historian was saying, well, you know that the Christian church, all the Jewish Christians, they all died. He said they died in Jerusalem in AD 70 when the Romans destroyed the city. He said that was the end of all the Jewish Christians. And after that time, Paul, the Apostle Paul, started a new church, he said, made up entirely of Gentile Christians. That was his, his theory. And the reason he had that theory, he said, because if they were in Jerusalem at that time, so complete was the destruction, they wouldn't have survived. There would have been no Jewish Christians left. And so that was, that was his, uh, his theory. I don't believe that that is the case, and I believe there are other books in the Bible, such as Romans, that would, would disprove that, that there were no Jewish Christians, uh, uh, that they were all in Jerusalem, rather, at the time of, of, of AD 70. But anyway, there's some very interesting, I think, uh, historical <coughs> accounts, you know, that uh, the campaign against Jerusalem, against the revolt in Jerusalem, began much earlier than AD 70, and that, in fact, the city was surrounded in AD 66 by the, the Roman commander Gallus, I think it was. And what happened was that, inexplicably, he retreated. He could have, he could have finished the city off, but he didn't. He retreated. And the Jewish Christians that were there in the city at that time took that as a sign and as a fulfillment of these words of Jesus' prophecy. And what do you think they did? They fled to the mountains. Now, you can read this in extra-biblical uh, history books. You can read it with people like Josephus. Anyone heard of Josephus, the historian? Famous historian, right? Jewish guy, uh, uh, not a Christian, but he, he records that the, the Christians fled from Jerusalem up into the mountains and that they uh, went to a place called Pella. Okay, it's a city, which is a place called Pella. Again, you read it in people like Eusebius, who's one of the early church fathers. He says, yeah, the, the, the Jewish Christians, when they were, when, when, when Gallus uh, retreated, they all got out, they went into the mountains, and they hid in, in the city of Pella. Uh, again, there were other people, I'll put one up here for you. Uh, another historian, the, the, the prophet can't read that, so the text is a bit small, but... Uh, yeah, I'll read it to you. It says, under the reign of Vespasian, he's the Roman emperor, Rome declared war against the Jews because of their repeated revolts, and General Titus besieged the city of Jerusalem, 70 AD. It is said that 1,100,000, i.e. 1,100,000 Jews perished in the six-month siege. It was a horrific siege. But the church there escaped the horrors of the siege by following the instruction of Christ in Matthew 24, again, again here in Luke 21, and fleeing to the mountains beyond the Jordan. This time the retreat was made to the small town of Pella. Now you can see there a picture of the Titus Arch in Rome. This is real things you can go and see, you can touch the, well, if you're up there you can touch it, but this is on the Titus Arch. In Rome, you can see a picture of the Romans taking away the menorah there. All the things out of the temple, they absolutely ransacked it. They absolutely flattened the, uh, the temple. They dug up the foundations of the temple. What did that do? Well, it meant that that Jewish religion at that time, remember, it was a mixture of uh, the Mosaic law and also the traditions of men. Because when, remember, Jesus comes to the Pharisees, he says, you're, you're teaching his commandments, the traditions of, oh, sorry, teaching his doctrine, the commandments of men. You know, that's his criticism of the Pharisees all the time, isn't it? You know, you're laying aside the word of God for your own traditions. So it was this mixture of all that stuff, and with the destruction of Jerusalem, there's no longer anywhere for them to bring their sacrifices. It was a, it was a system of sacrifices for sin, wasn't it? They took the animal sacrifices, lay them on the altar. The only place you could do it was in Jerusalem, and the only place you could do it was in the temple. Once the temple had gone, where did you make the sacrifice? It's the end of that system. That's why Matthew 24, 28, we read, For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. The carcass is that, that hybrid, if you like, mosaic or the traditions of men. That it, it's become a dead thing, and the eagles are the picture 
of the legions of imperial Rome that are gathered, gathered together all around Jerusalem for its destruction. And it's the fulfillment of uh, that prophecy by the Lord Jesus. Incredible, isn't it? These things take the Bible out of being just another religious book to actually something very, very valuable, something of inestimable value, something that is to do with you and me and history and life now. Not just something, oh yes, I have this spiritual side to my life. No, God is very much in our lives, isn't he? He's very much in the real world. He's not just somewhere where we go and well, I have this spiritual side to me. No, he is your life. That's why the words of the Bible are living words. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. John 6, 68. I think it's ironic that the verse that I read to you when, when, when we started uh, looking at this subject compared the word of God to a sword, didn't it? What, what does a sword do? Why, why do we have swords? They're to kill people, aren't they? That's why, that's why swords were invented. They're a weapon. And the idea is that they kill you, whereas the Word of God brings life. Whereas he said that the Word of God will convey either life or death to the hero. The Apostle Paul said, to the one we are the savour of death unto death, and to the other the savour of life unto life, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 16. Christ's gospel will bring spiritual life if you allow it to penetrate your heart. Just like a sword penetrates the heart of a person's body, so if you allow the word of God to penetrate your heart, then you will not have death, rather you will have life. You know, you read in, in the, old, uh, the Old Testament that Saul... Uh, fell on his sword, if he had fallen on uh, the word of God, it would have penetrated his heart and made a big difference. What's penetrated your heart this morning? Has the word of God got right into your heart? Have you hidden it in your heart so that you might not sin against the Lord? It's a living word, isn't it? In fact, the Bible talks about Christ himself, how the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's living in you. What makes the Bible the best book? Well, for me, um, you know, someone once said that the Bible is a book that shows you the way to heaven. I think that's a very valuable book, don't you? Because that's where I want to go. And I hope that when you read your Bible, uh, not just like the Pharisees, trying to remember as much of it as we can, trying to be regurgitated and say it as much as we can, but rather that it will become a living word to you, that God will speak to you through it. And that as James puts it, you would not be hearers of the word only, but you would be doers of the word.